So good morning, the world. Good morning, Barbara and Marion and William. And how nice to see Barbara here in Berkeley. So if someone could say, tell me if they hear the sound, that would be great. So good morning, everyone. And uh, I see that uh, the, the label of the live stream today is called Happy Hour. That's left over from yesterday afternoon's Happy Hour at IMC, and, and it wasn't changed back. But uh, it's um, delighted that uh, we could also call this Happy Hour, our time together. And um, as an introduction to uh, this guided meditation and I would like to say that uh, Buddhism has a lot to do with cultivating wisdom and cultivating compassion. Wisdom and compassion are called sometimes the two wings of the bird of Buddhism that keeps it flying. And um, the, um, there's one quality that I want to emphasize that is a great support for both wisdom and compassion, and that is uh, tranquility or calm. The more we need wisdom, the more important it is to be calm. The more we need compassion, the more important it is to be calm or settled. Agitation, stress is the, uh, you know, uh, disrupts our capacity for wisdom and for compassion. And for now, the um, um, with what is happening in the wider world, the distress and the, the people have, the challenges people have, the tremendous uncertainty of what's coming for so many of us, is a time for a tremendous amount of wisdom and compassion. And as we sit here this morning together, uh, my hope is that whatever calm that we are able to acquire or settle into, that we understand that we're doing it so that we we can become wise, so that we become compassionate. That uh, our meditation is not independent of what's happening in the right wider world, but it's to help us uh, become the kind of people that somehow can uh, be contribute, contribute to greater peace and well-being and safety for everyone. So, and I see there's one chat from UK saying it's good, good afternoon there. So, good afternoon the whole world. Good evening, or it's evening, and good morning here in California. So, um, t 
to sit, take a meditation posture that expresses for you some sense of purpose, the purpose of being alert, aware, and within that or with that to become tranquil. And this combination of tranquil and alert, alert and tranquil. And we begin, some of that's discovered through the body. And to be careful and caring with the posture you're in so that the posture can support a deep relaxation. If we're slumped in the couch, it might be relaxing in the short term, but it doesn't allow for the deepest possible relaxation. I once read a study that said that the two postures allow for the deepest relaxation is the cross-legged meditation posture and lying completely flat on the floor on one's back. And gently closing your eyes. And with, maybe with love or care or kind regard for yourself. Let your attention wander around your body caringly to find the places in the body that you can tend to care for by gentle relaxation, softening. Perhaps if you soften the belly, letting the belly hang forward, you can feel the weight of the body settle a little bit further down. Softening the chest, relaxing the shoulders. and softening the muscles of the face. And then to bring your care and intention, attention of kind regard to the experience of the body breathing. To do so less with a purpose of accomplishing something with attention to the breathing, but more an attention that is the vehicle for your care, for your kindness, for this body of yours. This body that breathes. And perhaps there can be a gentling of your breath. A feeling of tenderness to the body breathing. And 
And as you exhale, to let go. of your thinking. And even if the letting go is temporary, for the next little while, every time you exhale, see if you can soften, quiet, or let go of what you're thinking. As you exhale, letting go of your thoughts and letting go into a quiet or a calm within your body. And for the purposes of becoming tranquil, it's useful to soften, relax the thinking muscle. Any tension or pressure, contraction, agitation associated with thinking. The more pressure or tension there is associated with thinking, the more forceful the thinking will be. The thinking muscle is sometimes felt behind the forehead, center of the brain, sometimes muscles of the face, or even the shoulders and the belly sometimes is where the tension is, the chest. Whatever tension you associate with thinking, see if you can let it relax. Allow it to melt away.
noticing wherever you are feeling agitated or not calm. Whatever agitation you might feel, however subtle, hold that gently in awareness. If you can, avoid seeing it as a problem, but as something to hold in the warm, the warmth of your open palms, palm, palms of awareness. Care for it caring attention. Making space for it to begin to soften or melt by itself. Bringing a calm attention to that part of you that is not calm. As you exhale, softening the whole body, as you inhale, see if you can brighten the alertness as you inhale a greater clarity of attention in the body. And as you inhale and exhale, softening as you exhale, And being a little brighter with your attention as you inhale. And gently going back and forth 
softening and being alert, relaxing and being bright with attention. And then as we come to the end of this sitting, you might reflect for a few moments on two questions. As you consider how you feel right now, how you are at the end of the meditation, what wisdom perspective do you have for how you will live the day how you would like to live this day, or if it's nighttime for you, tomorrow. With, for what, and with whatever calm or subtleness you might have. How can you live this day with more compassion, kindness, care?
So good morning. Thank you for the sitting. And I'll continue now with this series of talks on effort. And these five different aspects of effort I'm speaking over, about over these five days are somewhat progressive. That uh, as people practice meditation or develop along the Buddhist path, the kind of effort that is needed or kind of effort that appears or uh, changes and develops or grows or evolves sometimes over time and sometimes it's more circular or spiral and so we you know we're all often you know beginning again and again the initial effort and um, so um, the uh, today I want to talk about well, what I've talked about so far is effort that we put into the practice. So the, in, the initiating effort, beginning again, beginning again, over and over again. And that can take a lot of work sometimes. Sometimes the forces of that pull us in opposite directions from practice, the forces of desire and addiction or hatred or fear are so strong that sometimes it takes a lot of work to really come back and begin again and take our seat, take our place, be mindful. As we're able to be more present, then uh, we contribute our choice. We kind of notice the, the dividing line or the fork in the path between those things that we do, mental states, thoughts, feelings, emotions, that take us um, uh, towards greater stress, tension, suffering, and those that lead to greater ease or happiness or well-being, wisdom. And there's some choice involved to choose one over the other, to let go of one, pick up the other, which path we take. And then uh, we make some effort, uh, and, and it's sometimes, you know, part of the, part of the art of meditation making effort to be continuous, to be persistent. So I talked about relaxed, persistent yesterday. Um, but we have to offer something. And, uh, and sometimes that offering of ourselves to be more continuous is more a continual opening up and allowing the attention to be there rather than holding the attention present. And so the balance between how much effort and how much allowing that effort, allowing effort we make is part of the art that we find our way with. So these first three days have to do about a lot of what we offer. At some point, as we settle in and are more continuous, have enough relaxation, at some point um, there's a kind of an effort, momentum or m movement that happens that is not, um, uh, that's being done to us. Rather than we practicing, we're being practiced. And I sometimes think of this as um, dharma energy. The dharma begins to move through us. And this idea of the dharma moving through us, that something begins to unfold, something, there's momentum, there's the, the pieces are, the foundations in place through our practice for some kind of uh, um, inner process of healing, inner process of evolving, inner process of liberating that can begin to flow and move through us. The Buddha used a lot of languages, a lot of different metaphors to refer to this inner movement uh, that is not our doing. It's not like we make it or our effort, but the previous effort puts together the conditions, creates the right environment for this plant, the seed, to grow and become a great plant. Or for the the um, um, you know, the boulder that was covering the spring has been taken away, and now the water can flow out from the spring. Um, so there's something begins to flow within us, to open and evolve within us. And learning to recognize and allow for something which is not us, that's within us, that begins to operate. The, um, um, and this idea that it's something, and not us, it's kind of like, you know, it's not the, one, the person we identify, the one who has agency, the person who in, within us who thinks we're in charge or it's up to us or that what we can do, that what, you know, kind of effort and 
ideas that we organize ourselves around, which is useful to get around the world oftentimes. But as the practice gets deeper, um, if we st- only stay in this kind of s- the part of ourselves that we kind of identify with or the part of ourselves that we can ad- identify or has agency or we think is responsible has to do, then we're not going to allow for this deeper Dharma energy to e- e- flow and evolve. Sometimes I think of this Dharma energy as being a relative of uh, the idea of chi or ki, that sometime, at some point we sit enough, at some point this chi or this kind of energy arises up from inside of us to kind of awaken us and lift us and keep us engaged nicely in the practice. It becomes almost second nature to be alert and present. We don't have to work at it. We mostly have to keep the boulders away from the spring. Mostly we have to keep the weeds away from the plants so they can grow. We mostly kind of clear the ground, let go of the distractions to let this kind of movement of energy or aliveness to happen through us. Um, There's movements of compassion that can well up. And um, I think some of the deepest forms of compassion or love or care are not something that we intentionally create or bring up, but really happens when we make space for it to allow. We might have the intention for it, but the intention is just kind of like opening the door for a particular room where compassion lives and it can, it can flow forth. We can um, uh, allow for wisdom. We can allow for greater, deeper understanding and intuition about what, how to find our way. Um, and rather than have to think, think everything out and solve it with our minds, uh, it's more like can we relax enough to let the important concerns we have kind of uh, be processed and solutions or ideas or perspectives well up from within. Some of this dharma energy that wells up within us um, is, you know, after a while, it kind of, the more we allow it, the more certain things seem like second nature. Meaning that, um, you know, if you... uh, I don't know if it's a good analogy, but if you put your hand on the hot stove, the hand will pull away. It's second nature to pull away and not get burnt. Uh, at some point, a greater sensitivity that comes with mindfulness for relaxed and calm and mindful, we become more sensitive. And we become sensitive to the slightest little uh, ouch, the slightest, slightest little place that where we're hurting ourselves, where we get contracted or we get caught in anger or hostility or where we're caught up in some kind of addiction. And we can start, we're sensitive to how that hurts in a way that we can't be sensitive to the subjective impact of it if we're caught up and blinded by the object of desire or the object of our ill will out there. But if we relax enough to really settle in and feel what's happening to me when I'm really caught in the grip of desire, or really caught in the grip of hostility. Oh, this hurts. This is, to, and as we start feeling that sensitivity, of course, we take our hand away from the stove. It's not like we even choose to do it. The whole system, the Dharma system that we are, begins to relax and pull pull away. And then we start feeling and sensing, uh, so, sooner or later, the benefits of practice the sense of relaxation, more importantly, uh, qualities of freedom and ease that come along with the practice. And that, of course, we lean towards that. The whole system is kind of like gravity. If you put a ball on top of a hill on the slope, it'll roll downhill. Our whole system wants to roll down towards greater and greater freedom. That as we get a sense of freedom and openness in meditation or through Buddhist practice or anything, that uh, of course our whole heart and system wants to flow uh, downhill. It wants to keep opening. It wants to keep opening. Partly because it's a lot of work to stay contracted. It's a lot of work to stay um, uh, tight. And so of course it wants to relax. Of course it wants to rest. So um, to start becoming sensitive to, aware of, 
that there is something else operating here in this practice besides what we do, that we're in charge of. We're in charge of the initiating effort. We're in charge of some of the choices that uh, between what's wholesome and unwholesome and useful and not useful. We're in charge a little bit of trying to support the continuity of awareness through the day. But as these begin to grow, we start becoming sensitive. There's something else operating here, something we can't quite take as being personal. It's, uh, you know, it's in us, so it's part of us in a sense, but it's not what we usually identify as being me, myself, and mine. And it's helpful not to identify it that way, to realize there's something much more here that's supporting of us. There's something much more uh, in nature. It's a, to, there's the wonderful natural process that we are has within it tremendous capacity of support and goodness. And so to begin to become sensitive to this deeper things that are operating. And at first, maybe it's just a little shy whisper, something very shy and maybe hesitant to show itself. And so, you know, we want to be very quiet and caring of it and not frighten it or grab a hold of it but slowly allow it to grow and develop. Let it kind of, the more we're aware of it, the more we open to it and hold dharma energy, dharma momentum, uh, the more space it has to grow. It's kind of like awareness is the sun and dharma energy is the plant. And so we bring the sun of awareness so the dharma plant can become great. And sooner or later, that plant will grow and develop a wonderful fruit. And one day that fruit, like an apple, will fall from the tree into the palm of your heart. May all your fruits bring you great freedom as they fall into your heart. So thank you very much for being here today. And tomorrow we'll do the last of the series on this on effort and then next week we'll go on to the next of the five faculties which is mindfulness and I'll do you know same thing a series of five talks on five different aspects of mindfulness so thank you all very much <laughs>